Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Instrumentation and Methodology for Contractile Measurements of Muscle Fibers. This is Haley Culleton from Inside Scientific and I will be your host for today's event. As a reminder, today's webinar has been extended to 80 minutes instead of our usual 60. Our session is sponsored by Aurora Scientific and will feature experts discussing the A to Z of assessing muscle performance and contractile functions in single muscle fibers. First, we will hear from Matt Borkowski, Sales Manager at Aurora Scientific. He will give an overview of the instrumentation and standard protocols used in elucidating the functionality of myofilament proteins to assess significant muscle fiber properties like power output, cross bridge cycling, and calcium sensitivity. Following, Dr. Tim West from the Structure and Motion Laboratory at the Royal Veterinary College in London will cover how to isolate and prepare single permeabilized muscle fibers to properly utilize this technique to measure these properties, along with how to analyze the data obtained from this assay. All right, well, I'm gonna welcome Matt uh, to our conversation. Hello, I'm one of your hosts, Matt Borkowski. I'm the Sales and Support Manager for Aurora Scientific, and I'll be taking you through uh, our presentation today about making contractile measurements in muscle fibers, uh, what permeabilized fibers are, and a little bit of an overview of the equipment used to perform these measurements. Before we begin, um, I'd just like to give you a bit of an overview about Aurora Scientific. So Aurora Scientific was founded nearly, uh, nearly 40 years ago by two professors from the University of Toronto. Uh, we've been serving the muscle mechanics community since about 1997, when we began selling uh, force transducers and uh, positioning motors. Since then, we've developed uh, stimulators, software, experimental apparatus to package our instruments into turnkey systems. And these systems range from testing isolated single skin cells uh, all the way up to uh, forces produced by whole large animals in vivo. Um, so the single permeabilized fiber system falls near the smaller side of the spectrum and is generally used by those researchers who have sort of a distinct interest in studying contractile proteins of the monofilament itself. So when we are talking about a test system for muscle fibers, um, what I'm really referring to specifically is a test system for single permeabilized muscle fibers, our model 1400A. And so this system will work with any muscle type, whether it's skeletal, cardiac, or smooth, and the same configuration can be used to work with fibers from many different animal models. This also includes fiber biopsies from humans. And the 1400A really represents the only system which Aurora Scientific offers, which is suitable for working with human samples. So our fiber system has the ability to accommodate virtually any custom protocols for measuring contractile properties. However, um, for the purpose of my presentation, we'll focus on the three most common ones that we see. Uh, force PCA, uh, KTR, and force velocity. And I know that my co-host, Dr. Tim West, will be uh, certainly going through force velocity relationship in greater detail. Uh, before I describe these protocols, let's just take a quick moment to define and discuss what I mean by permeabilized fibers. Permeabilized fibers could be described in the simplest of terms as being made permeable to the flow of calcium ions. Uh, this is accomplished uh, typically by uh, taking a small biopsy, dissecting it into some smaller workable bundle. Uh, these bundles are then immersed into a chilled um, special permeabilization solution, which has the addition of a special compound to make the membrane porous. Uh, this process can typically take a few minutes or up to you know, a couple hours, depending on the size of the bundles and the tissue type. Uh, te technically, the membrane can also be removed by mechanical means. Uh, sort of imagine removing a, you know, a sock or a stocking from your foot or your leg. However, this is much less common and a much more uh, difficult process for the average user. Uh, so now these permeable bundles are washed clean with um, dissecting solution to remove any traces of the permeabilization agent and are typically stored overnight 
uh, in a special storage solution. Uh, and if they need to, need it to be stored for, for longer, um, you could store them at minus 80. Uh, individual fibers the next day um, may be teased out from the small bundle, uh, which has now been permeabilized and then mounted in our apparatus for testing. Uh, testing requires a relaxing solution uh, without calcium or low calcium, and solutions with various concentrations of uh, calcium, higher calcium for contraction. Uh, because the calcium enters the fiber by diffusion, the use of a pre-activation solution um, to improve the rate of diffusion is, is, is typically viewed as important, especially with uh, larger fibers. So now that we have this fiber ready for the experiment, uh, how do we attach the fiber to the test system? So once it's dissected out of the bundle, it should be transferred into the larger mounting bath of the system, which contains relaxing solution. Um, the fiber is obviously quite small, so using some sort of tool, uh, like a cut pipette tip, um, you know, sort of as a boat, is, is essential. Um, Two sort of main methods of attaching the fibers to the instruments uh, are by suturing the fiber directly to some, some um, hook or, or tube. Uh, and the other, the other method is using a thin foil clip shaped like a letter T, which is sort of folded onto the fiber. Um, you can see it in this bottom photo here. And uh, this clip holds it in place. Um, they have a hole at the end which slides onto a pre-made hook. Um, you should typically attach these T-clips before transferring the fiber to the experimental chamber. Um, I believe that my, uh, my colleague, um, Dr. West, uh, uses this method in his lab. So um, there are some cases where adhesives have, ad adhesives, excuse me, have been used um, as sort of UV-based glues or silicone-based glues, but this is a lot less common. Um, shellac is another one. Um, so this attachment is, is a very critical part of the experiment. Um, if the fiber is not mounted well, it may slip out from the clip or the sutures, and any contractile data at that point is sort of unusable. The other sort of step uh, that you're performing after you've uh, mounted the fiber is to sort of set the um, ideal resting sarcomere length. Um, it, it will depend on the species, it will depend on the muscle. Um, you're sort of in the range of 2.5 to 2.7 microns for uh, skeletal, uh, something on the order of 2.2 for cardiac uh, fibers. Um, however, again, this is gonna vary from uh, muscle and uh, muscle to muscles uh, you know, and, and species. So now that we have the sample attached, um, let's, uh, let's look at sort of simplest protocol. Um, the most basic parameter that we want to measure uh, from these fibers is the maximum force production of the fiber itself. Uh, so here's how it would be executed. Um, we'd hold the fiber at the constant length, at, at the same sarcomere length we measured, so it's isometric. And it would be moved from a relaxing solution into pre-activation before being moved into a solution with sort of a lower or modest concentration of calcium. And then once immersed, the calcium solution um, will flow into the cell itself and uh, will notice an increase in contractile force. Um, once it plateaus, uh, we return the fiber back to the relaxing solution. So, this entire process uh, could be repeated uh, with slightly higher calcium concentrations each time until maximum uh, activation has been reached. And so um, uh, Tim will tell you a little bit more about this, but we can see that um, sort of relative force is plotted against this sigmoidal hill curve um, to sort of demonstrate um, calcium sensitivity of the fiber. So factors such as fiber type, um, sarcomere length, uh, uh, treatment with compounds or drugs, um, knockout model. This will all potentially have an effect on calcium sensitivity 
and forced production. So um, any comparisons sort of have to be uh, limited in scope. Um, the simplest terms, maximal force production gives us the most basic measure of muscle function. So um, performing this protocol can help us better understand how a specific factor or mechanism is going to affect the generation of force. So a second common protocol uh, with permeabilized fibers is the KTR test or coefficient of tension redevelopment. In this test, the fiber will be immersed in a very high calcium solution after pre-activating to produce the maximal force output immediately. Um, once we reach a plateau, fiber is rapidly slacked, uh, perhaps 20 or 25 percent, and then generally quickly restretched. Uh, afterwards, tension will begin to redevelop, and the time it takes to begin redevelop tension can sort of be measured. Um, a similar protocol uh, often performed with skeletal muscle is called a slack test. Uh, which involves just simply slacking the fiber without the rapid restretch uh, to determine unloaded shortening velocity. And so these experiments can kind of help us understand the contribution of the cross bridges um, and, and the mechanisms of the thin, uh, thin monofilament, um, such as uh, how a factor may affect the binding of calcium to uh, protein like troponin, or the interaction between actin and myosin. Uh, finally, um, uh, let's look at force velocity here. Uh, to begin, uh, the fiber would be maximally activated as before, uh, while being held at constant length. Um, we should record that maximal force, and then after reactivating the fiber until it reaches a plateau, uh, we sort of see these series of descending load clamps. Um, and again, Tim will go through this in more detail. Uh, so these load clamps uh, are implemented with uh, sort of a fast feedback loop through software. Um, and uh, at each step of the load clamp, uh, we observe this uh, shortening, or progressive shortening of, uh, of the fiber to maintain this, um, this lower percentage of, of maximal force. So the product of the load and the shortening velocity at any given point uh, will yield power, which we can plot against sort of the relative tension of the fiber. And this gives us a very good indication of the performance of the fiber under these sort of modified conditions. Um, so that's sort of an overview uh, of, of, of some typical experiments. But I'm sure everybody's sort of wondering, well, you know, how does this equipment work? And uh, I'd be happy to sort of describe the theory of operation of some of these instruments. So the, the main function um, of this system is to uh, measure, of course, tensile force. Therefore, the first instrument we should sort of discuss is our transducer model or series 400B. Typically, the absolute uh, tensile forces generated by a fiber are in the millinewton range, um, sometimes lower. So one of our models with a max range of about five or 10 millinewtons is typically a good choice. Uh, this provides us with sort of sub micronewton resolution, which is more than ample for these preparations. Um, and another important, really important feature uh, is the remarkably low compliance of the unit. Um, because the fibers are typically fairly short, perhaps on the order of a millimeter or less, even small movement of the measurement device will mean that the contraction is not truly isometric. And thus, um, these maximal forces reported would be lower than the true maximum if there's some shortening of the, of the preparation. Uh, Finally, the frequency response of the unit is approximately uh, one kilohertz, uh, which is um, more than adequate to sort of capture the dynamic properties of fibers from most species. So with the basic specs out of the way, let's just uh, briefly examine the, the general operating principle. Um, the force transducer sensor is essentially a capacitor and change in force is being detected by a change in capacitance. Um, and so this is induced through a, a flexing beam element 
um, to which the fiber is coupled. Um, the beam flexes very little, um, so there's less than a few microns of movement for a typical load, uh, and so there's no significant shortening of the fiber. Um, we have an identical sort of parallel reference beam, uh, which is integral to um, the sensor's operation, uh, and this reference beam allows us to use common mode rejection ratio to cancel the, the identical phase signals for each beam. And this eliminates a lot of noise uh, and baseline drift without having to use um, sort of invasive filtering, which filters the, the actual force signal itself. And I think this sort of makes the sensor somewhat of a happy medium between other designs that we see. Um, the frequency response is maybe not nearly as good as simple strain gauges, but the measurement element is certainly thicker and more durable. And uh, optical designs offer a lot more durability, but have much poorer drift characteristics and typically require a lot of filtering, uh, which can sacrifice the true frequency response. Um, so th this is sort of a nice fit for everything. We have um, sort of this uh, fast uh, servo motor because uh, the other function, of course, of the system is to change the length of the fibers to model different types of contractile conditions. So to perform basic length changes, we use a this fast servo, uh, typically uh, model 322 or 315C. Servo motors typically have a large working range. Um, ours is up to six millimeters, which is um, uh, quite enough for large passive stretches of the fiber uh, or even working with really long tissues. Uh, step response time is less than uh, half a millisecond, which is fast enough to per efficiently perform slack test or KTR, which we discussed earlier. Um, the motor can respond to frequencies in excess of two kilohertz, uh, which is very useful for making stiffness measurements, um, which we didn't discuss. Uh, it also has a high load capacity and uh, can sustain tensile forces of up to three or four hundred millinewtons, which is much higher than would be developed by any one fiber or even a typical bundle. So sort of the general operating principle uh, of this motor, it's, it's based upon a fast servo motor element. Um, it, it's rotational, it's not a linear uh, movement. Um, so although it allows large stretches and slacks with closed loop uh, position control, you sort of um, have to be aware of this uh, Z phase error, we call it, which is parallel to the to the focal plane of the microscope. So, you know, as you as you start to rotate quite a great deal, um, you potentially get uh, a little bit of um, uh, focus issues. But this is only at extremely large stretches and slacks um, for the largest of tissues. Uh, these um, these large excursions can't typically be accomplished with your average piezo element. Um, and as I mentioned, um, rotational movement can be approximated because uh, the angle which the motor is rotating through is, is still small, less, uh, uh, less than 10 degrees typically. So the, I guess the star of the show is um, our permeabilized fiber apparatus. It's this automated um, uh, eight well plate with um, uh, 120 or 160 microliter volume. Um, some of the main features of this apparatus are this automated movement of the baths with precise control, meaning the plate will always arrive in the same spot every time. Um, the ability to control the temperature of the bath or the platform itself uh, with a Pelchier uh, between zero to 40 degrees. Um, uh, the unit which Dr. West used is, is, is sort of a special version uh, which has um, two um, temperature zones in the, um, in the plate, uh, a cold and a warm for um, a temperature jump activation. And uh, the bath switching time is, is, is pretty quick. Um, a typical bath to bath time um, is just over a second. So um, the sort of general operating principle here is it's an eight well plate controlled by two stepper motors. One is meant to index bath to bath, and the other will move it up and down. Um, 
bath locations are marked by flags, so the bath will only move upwards when it is aligned with the flag in a safe spot. Um, because the bath will drop, it's necessary to use long, being, long working distance objectives uh, when mounting the apparatus on an inverted scope, so there's no risk of the bath bumping into the objectives. Uh, it's also recommended to use a, a flat uh, three-plate stage on the inverted scope to make alignment with the, um, the fiber sort of straightforward. Um, although the system is pretty powerful, it wouldn't be very useful without a comprehensive software package to turn experimental protocols into a proper set of instructions. Uh, we've written a dedicated software package uh, called 600A, which is tailored to sort of suit the unique needs um, of these muscle mechanics experiments. Um, all experiments are performed with our sort of custom real-time Linux software. That's what we've written it in. Um, they're saved in an open format. Um, there is a library of standard protocols to allow for um, near infinite customization. And uh, we feel it's sort of straightforward to use despite being um, uh, on a Linux OS. Um, once the sample is attached and measured, uh, you sort of load the protocols and begin. Finally, um, a word about the other piece of software that we use with the system is this uh, high-speed video sarcomere length software. Um, it's a camera-based software suite for sort of performing visualization and some analysis of um, the sarcomere spacing um, of the fiber. Uh, it's a very high frame rate CCD camera, which interfaces uh, with the control suite, um, potentially for SL control, or at least um, some, some, some feedback to be recorded with the um, uh, force and length uh, uh, traces. Um, there is an expansion edge detection uh, uh, and uh, laser-based uh, modules that we have. They're, they're sort of in development. Um, the camera uh, suite is the, um, is the main piece of software uh, that we're using now for this sarcomere visualization. So just to sum up, what standard experiments can we perform? There's uh, this passive and active stiffness, uh, which I briefly uh, mentioned when um, discussing the specifications of the motor. Of course, force PCA, KTR, and force velocity, which we discussed in more detail. Slack test, um, again, similar to uh, KTR. This idea of length-dependent activation, um, activating the fiber at different uh, sarcomere lengths or overall lengths. And of course, several others, which we don't have time to uh, go into right here. Great. Thank you so much for your presentation, Matt. I will welcome Dr. Tim West to take it away whenever he's ready. Hello, and welcome to the second part of today's webinar entitled Determining Single Muscle Fiber Power Using Temperature Jump and Force Control Methods. I'd like first to thank Matt for providing his overview of Aurora, the Aurora permeabilized fiber setup. And more generally, I'd like to thank the teams at Aurora and Inside Scientific for giving me the opportunity to discuss how we use this very nice piece of apparatus. Well, I'm lab manager and researcher in the Structure and Motion Laboratory, which is a research group in the Department of Comparative Biomedical Sciences at the Royal Veterinary College in London. The Structure and Motion Lab consists of five main research teams, and we have overall upwards of 30 members, including the PIs, postdocs, graduates, students, and project students, and technical staff. The group is quite diverse, but the common theme is trying to better understand the limits and constraints on animal locomotion and performance and efficiency of movement. Of course, muscle function plays a big part in performance and efficiency of movement. It is my aim today to tell you a bit about the work we've been doing on comparative skinned or permeabilized fiber mechanics. Well, really, my title here could or should have been had a, had a subtitle or an extension to note specifically that I'll be uh, addressing temperature jump and force control methods using the Aurora 1400A apparatus that Matt introduced earlier. I'm not aiming here to deliver a lecture on the general hows and whys of using temperature jump and force control to evaluate molecular level cross bridge mechanisms. Indeed, our ambition in our group has been to look outward from the muscle cell in the sense of trying to uh, 
make broad and robust um, quantifications of single fiber power and then trying to integrate the results with those of whole muscle and whole animal biomechanics. Since in many of our studies in the Structure and Motion Lab, we are working with skin fibers from uh, single muscle biopsies, our ultimate goal is to be as confident as possible that a series of single fiber assays serves as a good surrogate of whole muscle function in vivo. So here are my specific aims to, to firstly focus on, on force time courses like we see on the right here um, of a rabbit extensor muscle and an impala biceps um, femoris single fiber, single fibers in both of these sets of records. I'll describe how the Aurora 1400A apparatus has been modified to accommodate temperature jump. That's uh, this phenomenon here where we activate the fiber at, in the cold at one degrees um, and then as fast as we can move the fiber into our test temperature. In this case, it was 25 degrees and we follow the force time course during so-called temperature jump to a peak. So here you can see with the graphic over the time axis, we are highlighting that the fiber is in an activated state early at, at low temperature and a tiny amount of force is generated. And then it develops force more rapidly to an isometric plateau once the temperature is changed to 25 degrees. We'll go over that sequence again shortly. Um, secondly, we'll go through the software features that initiate switching the 1400A system into a so-called force control mode and it allows us to clamp the force at more than one level during a single activation. Um, these downward spikes that you see in each of these records are all individual uh, force control events as I call them. Uh, the difference being in the top record here there's only a single force control and in the bottom record bottom time course we've done four different force control events during one single activation. We can't see very much on, the, on this time scale, but I'll expand in on these, uh, zoom in on these as we go through the presentation. We'll go through some of the curve fitting that we do to get uh, so-called normalized power from our records. And I'll give you a brief overview of some of the data sets that we have gotten from using each of these different kinds of approaches. But I'll, focus, I'll be focusing mainly on how we feel that we get most, the most out of the Aurora system to evaluate peak power generation in single fibers. The one or two data sets that I'll show are really brief, very brief summaries. It's really the single representative force time courses like these here that are shown that will be front and center through most of my presentation. My aim, my guess, or my take home message will be to show how and why we have explored the Aurora tools to help us evolve our measurement approaches from this type of record on the top with a single force control event to this type of record on the bottom where we get four events in one activation. Okay, so this is that, that same rabbit single fiber that I showed you on the previous slide, but I've, I've simplified the graphic below a little bit. And this is the, uh, the bath change apparatus that comes with the 1400A permeabilized fiber setup. Um, so we have eight baths eight fiber baths, and really, we only really use um, four of them, the first two here and the second two on this section of the, the uh, plate that's shown here. So really we're going from bath one and two, bath ones and two here from a, a pre-activation state to an activation state in the cold, some force generated. These gray lines here are when the apparatus is changing from one bath to the other. So there's some force developing in the cold and baths three and four on the warm side of the apparatus. Um, the modification here that Aurora's made is that normally this plate comes as a single plate and temperatures controlled for all of the, the entire plate at one level. But what they've done in their temperature control modification is to split the first two baths and the final six baths so that there's a gap here that's a continuous gap straight through the plate and on this side we can control the temperature differently from on this side. So what happens is we take the fiber through this sequence get it into a temperature jump state and then we do our so-called force control event. 
and that's what this looks like down here. So this, this area that I've circled in red here is zoomed in down here. And this is the, look, we're looking at the relative force change, the relative length change, the velocity that um, is achieved by the motor, and the power normalized for fiber force and for fiber length and units per, per second. I'll say more about that normalization as we go along. So we set the, the system, once it's in a stable isometric state, we ask the system to find a new force and we control the force. In this case, it was just below 50% of the isometric force. This is the response of, of the motor to keep the force at that level. And the velocity of that length change during the steady period of force uh, control in this case was just under two muscle lengths per second. And the power that was generated was about 0.6 in these in these normalized units. Well, just some practical points before I leave this slide. Um, one thing is that the, the Aurora sends us out a uh, a single cover slip to form the bottom of this um, bath array, and you adhere the the cover slip yourself. It's essential if you're doing the temperature jump modification to actually split that cover slip so that there's a small piece covering these two and a separate a longer piece covering these final six baths. If you don't do that, you'll you'll not have a continuous air gap here. And when this cold size starts to cool down, condensation will build up in here and you'll be disrupting the temperature um, difference between the two sides of the bath. A minor point is that in retrospect, I might've asked, maybe there's a good reason that Aurora can't do this, but we, we can ask Matt about that in the Q&A session. But in retrospect, I might've asked to isolate baths seven and eight here as the cold baths rather than baths one and two. At the moment, this larger volume bath, this volume of this bath is about two times that of these other baths. And it's really, we're underusing it really. All it is is serving as a, as a bath for us to hold our so-called pre-activation solution. And we, we overuse how much solution we actually bathe the fiber. And so I wonder if we could have had baths seven and eight isolated uh, at the cold temperature and instead of baths one and two. Finally, the whole of the apparatus here is mounted on top of a, an inverted microscope. And that's a 40X objective below the, uh, the bath change apparatus. It's essential that you have a long working distance objective below the apparatus. In this case, the, object, the working distance of this 40X objective is about seven millimeters. Um, so when the bath changer drops down and moves along, it's not bashing into the um, to the lens as it, as it makes that move. Um, we aren't doing anything particularly special with the optics above. This is a, a, an old Nikon diaphot that we literally rescued from the trash almost. And, and, it's, and there's nothing special about it. The illumination from above is an LED and it is, it is filtered through the condenser that's up above, but really this is not a particularly expensive 40X lens. And this is the kind of uh, images we can extract from using the Aurora 900B video camera. This is a quail fiber, a quail pectoralis fiber that Jim Usherwood has been, uh, started a new project in the group and we've had some of these fibers on the rig recently. Yeah, so that's some practicalities about using the temperature jump version of the permeabilized fiber apparatus. Well, the next thing to do is just to repeat that, um, I'll just go back once, um, to repeat this experiment several times. And the idea of, is to uh, collect several different force clamps over a range of different rel of relative forces. Um, well, somewhere between zero and isometric. Um, so that when you plot the data as normalized power against um, normalized force, there is sufficient data on either side of this peak that it won't, uh, you won't have to make any uh, constraints on the curve fitting procedure. Of course, the data could, like this can be used to generate the more usual looking velocity force relationships as well. So that's a single fiber with one to seven different activations at different levels of force control to give us this power force relationship. Um, this is the relationship that we fit to the normalized 
power force data for each fiber. I hesitated putting this slide in at all, but I think it's instructive, particularly with the suggestion that you visit the reference here, Curtin et al. in the Journal of Experimental Bi Biology. You'll find a good description there of the derivation of this equation, which is really a, re an a, an a rearrangement of the, the hill type force velocity equation. The equation describes the normalized value Q as a function of relative force. Three variables are free to vary, Q max, the force, the relative force at Q max, and the force intercept on the relationship. Q max is really the key value that we want to extract from the curve fit, along with the relative force at maximum power. We set the equation up in Excel, Solver, and MATLAB, whatever, whatever uh, curve fitting tool you like. And like I say, it's mainly the value of Q max that we're after. We want to that we want to retrieve from the process. The power values that we're fitting are normalized, you'll notice, for fiber force and fiber size, and the units are in per second. For, for curve fitting of the data from a single fiber, this normalization for isometric force in particular is helpful for, for the fitting process. And that's because isometric force will tend to vary for a single fiber that is activated several times. In fact, um, from the first activation to the final one in the series, the isometric force will tend to, to drop continually over the process. Um, so this normalization helps to, in the curve fitting process um, to smooth the, the data points. After the fit finds a value for Qmax, you can get back to a power value in more familiar units of, of watts per liter by multiplying the Qmax by the maximum isometric st stress observed in the series of activations. Um, that's the stress in units of kilopascals or kilonewtons per square meter. I won't go through the calculation here, but it, it is useful to go through the dimensional al analysis yourself to convince yourself that that, that works. Well, here's, here's a bit of data that we collected using that approach. So we're looking here at comparison of skin fibers and intact fiber bundles from wild rabbit perineus longus and extensor digiti 5 muscle. And this is again that um, Curtin et al. from Journal of Experimental Biology in 2015. Um, we have of, between the two kinds of muscle, we collected observations for 141 skinned fibers and 16 intact electrically excitable muscle bundles. And we were trying to compare the contractile features between the two. And, and for isometric stress, uh, normalized max power and maximum power in watts per liter, there are essentially no real difference. There's some difference in the relative force at max power and the velocity of max power, which probably is telling us that the, the curvature of the force velocity relationship between the skin fiber and the intact fiber is different. But for the parameters that, that um, help us tell us something about um, peak performance, there's not really any difference between the skin fibers that we received and the intact fiber bundles that we took from uh, those wild rabbits. So we've concluded in that paper that the single skin fibers produce the same power and force as intact fiber bundles from muscles of wild rabbits. Well, we have, we have some what I call local rules for, for dealing with this kind of um, force time course and these force control events. The first is that um, the, the isometric stress for us has to be le more than 75 kilopascals. That, that, that's not a number we had in mind when we started the study on the rabbit fibers, um, but the more and more and more data collected that we collected, we realized that uh, anything below about that value is really uh, the fiber wasn't uh, part of the the general um, fiber population that we were looking at. So if it was less than 75 kilopascals, it was left out of the analysis. Over the set of seven plus activations using force control, the, the isometric force or stress needs to remain above 80% of the maximum observed. So I mentioned earlier that you know to get these seven observation, it means doing this temperature jump and this uh, temperature jump activation at least seven times. And over the period of those seven or eight activations, the force, will, the isometric force, will tend to drop. If it drops below eighty percent, it's not that we abandon the entire data set, but we we definitely leave that record out of the analysis. <laughs> 
finally, we, we, we disregard the record if the period, during the period of force control, there's either some major force oscillations or there's a force over or undershoot of the target force. So we can, of course we can't deal with oscillations and that, that can happen if you set up the parameters incorrectly in the, uh, the uh, dialogue boxes in, that I'll come to in, in a few more slides. Um, and we also can't really cope with an over or an undershoot of the target, a drastic one anyway. If the, uh, the force dropping here is dropping so slowly that it's still dropping in this period where we measure the average uh, stable uh, force during shortening, it will give us the wrong answer really. It's the same if it overshoots and is slowly coming back into this zone. And that's because we, we batch analyze these. We don't really modify this period where we're, where we're collecting an average. Um, we, we analyze fibers in batches, uh, sorry, we analyze a single fiber in a batch and we analyze several fibers in a batch as well. So we don't modify this period of time um, for capturing an average value at all. So we can't cope with either wild oscillations or slow, lazy declines into that period or recovery of force after uh, an overshoot. So, so in that previous rabbit study that I showed you, um, there were a hundred, there were, there were only two fibers out of 143 that we um, abandoned, uh, didn't, you didn't analyze because they fell afoul of these rules. So, so you say to yourself, well, that means it's working pretty well. Why bother changing it? We, we've got this assay that, of uh, fiber power and force that's working quite well. Why change it? Well, one motivator really is that we, we wanted a way to, to get more data on either side of this power force relationship. If we lose one of these, um, it really makes uh, forces us into making a few more constraints than we need to on the on the curve fit. So we wanted to see, first of all, whether we could populate more of this curve without really doing more activations. And for, in fact, we wanted to do fewer activations, but get more data points. Um, that was thing one. Thing two is that, that we go through seven individual activations here. It takes a lot of time and it, it's really, it's sort of wasteful of solution as well um, to get through these seven activations, seven or eight activations. Um, there'll be at least one complete change of the activating solutions, sometimes more than one. So we wanted firstly to be able to get more data with fewer activations and economize really on the, uh, the solutions that we need to make up for the assay. So this is what we came up with. And it really was, it was really Roger Woolage and Nancy Curtin who just stated this idea and it was up to myself and, uh, two brilliant technicians in, in, in the group, um, Rebecca Dyack and uh, Maya Lorenk to, to, to make it work, to make it happen with the Aurora apparatus. So we're, we're not doing anything differently with the bath changes. We're still using bath one and bath two here as our cold activation, bath three and bath four for the warm activation and relaxation. Nothing is really any different here. Um, the thing that is different is that instead of a single force control event, we now have four for one activation. This is um, a leopard fiber from a biopsy of the biceps femoris that I collected recently, and I'm still working on the leopard, leopard data set. Um, so this particular activation here is populating the peak area of the power force relationship here, and we need to do Two more of these, if we're lucky. Two more of these to collect a set of data on the ascending side, let's call it, the ascending side of the power force relationship, and another, more, another one to do collect data on the descending side of the power force relationship, and we're done. So if it works well, in three activations, we'll get uh, 12 data points instead of um, eight, and we're doing a little bit better for populating the whole of uh, a broader range of, uh, of relative forces in this relationship. So, so what I'll do now is just go through some of the, um, the setup windows and control windows in the uh, Aurora software that we use. Uh, some might look for quite familiar to you. This one, first one where we're just trying to collect the a value of fiber stiffness. Um, 
anybody who your, uses the Aurora apparatuses and use it in force control mode will probably be familiar with this, but I'll start here anyway. Um, so this is, again, some, uh, we're dealing with a, a leopard fibered fragment. Um, the, the length of this fragment was uh, 0.64 millimeters that we call that our L naught at a sarcomere length of 2.5 microns. That's our, our standard setup when we're dealing with mammalian um, skeletal muscle fibers. What we, to, what we do to get our um, stiffness measurement is we target a length uh, change of 0.5% of L naught, and we're trying to do a release of 0.5% from the isometric plateau. So on the length set up parameters, we're putting in a negative 3.2, negative for, to tell us that it's gonna be a, a step down, and a ramp time of four milliseconds at a hold time of two milliseconds. Um, so we, we set the fiber off through its protocol. It's going from the pre-activating solution into its activation in the cold, temperature jump, and we're keeping an eye on this plateau. And at some point in the plateau area, we have, a, we have a, quite a bit of time to do this, but at some point we push the record DFDL button and the system is then looking at the change in force for a given change in length and it populates this window with a stiffness value, a so-called stiffness value. Uh, in fact, it populates all three of these windows, but the, really this is the, the key one for, for moving on with uh, doing some force control measurements. In this case, uh, for this particular fiber, it was uh, a value of 45.9 millinewtons per millimeter. Um, the more you do these, the more you get a little bit intuitive for what that value is going to be. And, and indeed, the, in the Aurora manual, it, it goes so far as to tell you, well, you can just um, manually populate this window if you want with, with a value that you figure is going to be about right. But we've tried that, and, and it's a little bit unsatisfactory in the sense that, that the subsequent force controls uh, aren't, very, very, um, aren't very good for us. And that, that's, you would only ever do that if, 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 say, you've moved on to doing force controls and it the system crashes for whatever reason. You, you know all of the setup parameters. You can physically enter a value here and move on with your experiments, but we've not found that it works. And maybe we can discuss that with, with Matt um, as we go along. So it might, you might be looking at this as well. We have to burn an activation to just to get the stiffness value, but really it's not a big deal. We would do this, we would do a, a, an isometric activation anyway at the beginning of any of our tests. We, it certainly would tell us, for example, um, if this fiber was going to tear, if it was going to meet our 75 kPa threshold that we would keep, uh, that we would, that would tell us to go on with the experiment. So we would do an isometric anyway. Um, it's no a big concern for us to actually do that experiment to get this value, um, um, to, get the, to get this window populated. Um, so then we move on to looking at the force control event. It's a bit of a busy slide here, but what I'm gonna be looking at is the, the setup of the force control settings, the gain, the integral TC, the filter TC, and the linear, linear range to get this record set, which is a quartet of values. And I've got the first two highlighted in red and the second two highlighted in blue, because we're really, even though we're collecting them as a quartet, we're also collecting them as pairs. And I'll explain that as we go along. Um, so we've, uh, we've pressed apply. So the, the, the values for, uh, stiffness are, are recorded by the system. And in this case, for this leopard fiber, um, we needed a integral TC value of 0.32 and a filter TC value of 0.32 to collect data for these two first points in this force, uh, time course. The gain is not something that we um, change a lot, uh, a value of, of about 0.85. It's always for us, whenever we're doing force control with this apparatus, it's always above 0.8. And we, we have not experimented at all with the linear range. We leave it at 1%. And really, we haven't experimented with, with changing that at all. So we've set this up and we've pressed the apply button. So the system knows in the first instance that these settings are um, 
the first set of force controls is going to be responsive to those. Then immediately before we do anything, we replace those, but we don't press the apply button. If we press the apply button, then it would be responding to these. So we've got those first two red values in place and we set the system going. This time, we, we, set, we watch the force record, we get our uh, activation in the cold, temperature jump, one force control, second force control, we're keeping our eye here, and when the plateau and force is recovered, we press the apply button. These two values are now recorded in the system and apply to the following two um, force control events. Um, and we have, to, we have to do that. We have to do that in pairs. Um, we're not so fast that we can do it individually for each, each force control event. We couldn't put a, a separate set of values in for each force control event, but we can do it in pairs. And particularly at this peak area where there's not a whole lot of difference in the power over a range of, uh, of for, uh, relative forces from about uh, 0.4 down to 0.25, something like that. Um, it's actually quite forgiving in here. Um, so you notice these two values um, uh, previously for the red values were 0 0.3, 0 0.32 and 0.32. Here they're 0.3 and 0.3. Uh, we can do that, keep those values pretty much the same for collecting this uh, pair, this quartet of values at the top of this uh, peak. When we move into the ascending side or the descending side, these values actually start to separate. So they're not exactly the same. In fact, I think the filter TC is always a bit lower um, for e no matter which pair you're collecting. So again, we do that. We collect this core type of values. We um, set the fiber up again for another activation to collect this four set of values and do it a third time to collect the four values on the ascending side of the relationship. So this is a, an example of the stable force control uh, times four and, and length changes. Now I've got the length record in here. I'll talk about a bit more about that during a single T-jump activation. And we're looking here at, again, that same leopard fiber, the cold activation, the T temperature jump, and the four downward spikes in force that uh, signify the four different uh, force control events. We also have, I, this is the first time I've shown you the length changes that we go through here um, at the same time. And these drop downs are all to the same level, about 70% of the resting length. And these are all baseline checks. And you might be saying, well, why so many baseline checks? Um, I'll, go, I'll go through that in, in just a second. Um, so here we're zoomed in on the, the first record in this uh, quartet and the final um, force control event in this quartet. And we're looking at the solid line here is the force change, and the dashed line is the response of the motor to, say, to asking the system to hold the force, in this case, at about 35% of isometric force, and in this final case, at about 25% of the isometric force. Um, so you see the motor change is a bit slower, a bit faster, to hold the force at a lower level of isometric. After each force control event, we drop the, we drop the length. So we're switching quickly from force control back into length control. We drop the length down to 70%. And that is, an, is, uh, is enough for the, to make the fiber go slack. When the fiber goes slack, now the force is responding to the length change. The force drops to zero. And we do that baseline check after every force control event. In addition, we do it before we started the whole process in the pre-activating solution, we've checked the baseline and in the relaxing solution after the, the whole of the activation is over, we check the baseline again. Um, partly that level of baseline checking is, is us being a little bit obsessive from the early days when we were concerned that there was, there was some drift in the baseline um, in doing these, uh, these kinds of activations, but there, there isn't any drift. It doesn't drift, but we just keep them in because uh, um, we haven't changed the protocol. 
And there are other good reasons to drop during the uh, force control event to drop the force, or sorry, to drop the link to 70% uh, to check the baseline as well. Uh, twofold. One, it was still, we're, we're checking on, on, an, on, a, on, a, on a drift. There might be the second reason the, that we, uh, the second advantage of doing this, um, this drop down to 70% is the fiber is slack here. So we're re-lengthening the fiber from a, flat, a slack state. Um, we've tried re-lengthening the fiber right after the force control event is over, but we found that there were some overshoot spikes in the force, which is not something we could cope with if we were trying to get these events completed very quickly. Um, so we avoid that overshoot by going by length, re-lengthening the fiber from slack. And the other point to make is that every time we're doing uh, a force control, we're asking the system to check the difference between the isometric force that's recovered and the baseline force just in advance. So, so we're asking the system to find, uh, in this case, 35% of the difference between isometric force and baseline. And we do that every time as well. And those are all um, uh, ways to ensure that the if there is any baseline drift that we try and uh, minimize the impact of it. So, so this is a protocol that we've set up to do this force for um, stage uh, force control uh, after T jump. I mean, it's a long, it's a long um, protocol, but there's a lot of repetition repetition in here. I'll just go through what we do early on in the, Act in the uh, cold state, and I'll go through the first force control event after the temperature jump, um, just to show you what we do with the uh, um, the protocol. And then after that, really, it's just a repetition of that by and changing the level of force control that you want to achieve. So in this first one, for example, we achieve thirty five percent of isometric, thirty percent, twenty five percent, and twenty percent. Anyway, this this is this is how we, we start we start the system off uh, the fiber off in a, a relaxed fiber. We push the um, uh, start test button. It moves the fiber into the cold bath one, which is where our pre pre-activating solution. The pre-activating solution is just a is a, a low a low calcium and low EGTA. So it's uh, getting the ready um, primed for its activation. Um, this is where we enable the data. It's there for 50 seconds, but we don't need to collect all of that data. We collected maybe a couple seconds of it just to do our first um, baseline check. So here we're dropping the length to 70% of L0. And we sample the force while it's slack. And we um, then bring the, the, the length back to L0 in step change. So these are both step changes in uh, pre-activating solution. Then we activate the fiber in bath two. Um, this this sarcomere link trigger, it's it's a command that that isn't doing anything for us here. It doesn't hurt that it's there. We've been experimenting with trying to collect uh, video files of the sarcomere length, and you need a sarcomere link trigger for that. Um, we're still experimenting with that, but it it doesn't hurt to have it here in the protocol, uh, even though it's uh, um, even though we're not using it really. Um, so we're in bath two, the fiber is being activated. We collect some, a little bit of force and then it moves into bath three for the temperature jump. And we do this force sample protocol again, when the force reaches its peak isometric value, we sample the force again. And each of those, uh, force samples in the first instance, uh, in pre-activating solution, the force sample was stored in bin one. In the second force sample, it's stored in bin two. And then, so those are memorized uh, in, um, by the uh, software. Uh, then we do our force step. And the force step we want to do is to 35% of isometric by looking at the difference between bin two and bin one. So it's saying, I want to go to 35% of the difference between these two values. That difference command, I don't know if that's crept into the, uh, into the Aurora manual or not. We, we were 
we were discussing with the Aurora team how, could, how we could do this, and they told us about this difference command. It's been very useful for us, actually. Um, so the force control event lasts for 20 milliseconds. Then we step the force down to gain the slack um, length again. We do another force sample, store that in bin three, and then we ramp the fiber up to L naught again over about five, a period of five milliseconds. That, that baseline is stored so that it can be used for the next um, force control event. So the next one is a difference between bin four and bin three. And we do that all the way through the process. Finally, we relax the fiber at 25 degrees and we check our baseline one last time. Okay, so, so the same local rules apply um, when we're looking at uh, this four um, force control event as in our single force control event. We still have this 75 kPa cutoff for um, keeping the, the data um, in the analysis. Um, over the three activations, recall that we need to do this three times to collect 12 data points for the power force relationship. Over the three activations using force control, the isometric force is at least 80% of the maximum. Um, so, so here you see in this case, this is one of the uh, wild uh, rabbit fiber that we've um, Sorry, not, that's wrong. This is an impala fiber. You can see the force is dropping a little bit, even during this activation. The second activation um, will drop a little bit more. Uh, that compares with sometimes you see no change in isometric force at all. This is the leopard fiber that I've been carrying through the, the set of slides here. And really, there's, through the, uh, this entire activation, the force is not dropping at all. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. And the key point is that we still maintain this 80% this cutoff. Um, if any one of these, and it's usually the last one in the series, drops below this 80% this value, we leave it out of the subsequent analysis. And, and similarly, we would disregard uh, the value if there's any force oscillations or force over or undershoot of the target. Um, Th this is this is a little bit of undershoot. That's that that level of undershoot we can actually cope with. You can see it. There is some dampening through the period that we're actually measuring the um, uh, the force um, during shortening. But um, that level of overshoot is not a drama really. Um, we can handle that, and we see it quite a bit actually. Maybe even a bit more we could handle. If it overshoots too much, it'll go off into this oscillation phase, which would uh, dampening oscillations, which we can't cope with. We'd have to do redo the experiment. Okay, so I'll I'll finish with with just a brief overview of some of the recent data where we where we, where we've used this these approaches. This is data from biceps femoris fibers from African plains predators and their prey. We have data for between 30 and 60 fibers from biopsies from at least five cheetah, uh, lion, zebra, and impala. We're looking at the cheetah and impala as a predator prey pairing and the lion and zebra as, as a separate predator prey pairing. The biopsies were retrieved from anesthetized animals that were darted by Alan Wilson and then fitted with GPS tracking collars. So th there's a sort of warts and all depiction of the data in, the, in these uh, plots here. Um, the first is looking at um, fiber, the dependencies of fiber force and cross-sectional area. We've got fiber power dependence on fiber volume. And here we're looking at the, the obvious dependence of, of peak power on the stress at peak power. Um, all of the data is depicted here. Um, and the thing I, I'm trying to show here partly is that the, the spread of fiber sizes, um, it's about six fold in fiber cross section and, and about six fold in, in fiber volume as well. Um, that it's not that we have six fold as a target, but the aim is to really sample, um, a wide range of fiber sizes, partly so that we can collect this kind of relationship, but partly because we are interested in characterizing the fibers in the biopsy. And by doing so, we assume the fibers in the whole muscle of the animal. 
you note here in the relationship between maximum uh, fiber power and fiber volume use seems to identify a, a subgroup of fibers where the power is relatively low for their fiber size. These power values, um, these low power values also had relatively slow shortening velocity at peak power. Um, these were all fibers that passed our, our quality control tests that I mentioned earlier. So we had no reason to leave them out of the analysis, but, but we were interested in, in maximum power. So we, we looked at these fibers uh, uh, in the entirety and in separation as well. So these same fibers, you can kind of see that they separate out in this relationship. Um, everything below this dashed line is, is one of these, as we call them, low performance fibers. Well, we summarized the data with and, out, with and without this small subgroup of low power or low performance fibers. But really, we were most interested in peak power generation. So you see here that I've highlighted average peak power for the so-called high performers of the predators combined and the prey combined. We find that the high performance fibers from the biceps femoris of predators are a bit stronger, faster, and more powerful than those from the, the prey muscles. This uh, fits with observations from the GPS tracking, which show that the predators show greater accelerations and decelerations in their prey species. And we've used the data collectively to model hunt behaviors in these two predator prey pairings. You'll need to go to the uh, to the reference by Wilson and I'll to see the details of how we integrate muscle and whole animal locomotion data. I wanted here just to give you a quick flavor for how we have used um, some the, these fiber um, force control approaches uh, to uh, collect uh, um, quite a large data set. Thanks. Well, I'll stop there and I'll just thank Matt once again and his team at Aurora Scientific and Haley and her team at Inside Scientific. And uh, finally, I'd like to acknowledge Nancy Curtin, Roger Woolage, and Alan Wilson as, as equal partners in the design and execution of these fiber studies and acknowledge the technical expertise and stamina, let's say, of uh, Rebecca Dyack and Maya Larenk, who, were, uh, who collected most of uh, the fiber data that I presented here today. Um, I'll stop there and I'll look forward to the Q&A session that follows. Okay, Tim, thank you so much for your presentation today. That was fantastic. Um, without any further ado, let's welcome Matt back and we're going to jump straight into our Q&A session. Thanks, Haley. Great. Thanks, Haley. Okay, Tim, first off, um, we're going to start with you. What is your um, bath cleaning procedure and any best practice you could possibly share? Well, really, we we um, we don't do anything um, all that special. We have a, a a suction device that that deposits the the um, the cell volume into a into a into a vacuum flask, and really, with one hand we're flooding the chamber with water, and the other hand we're sucking it away uh, uh, from the chamber. And really, all we ever use is is deionized water to clear the chamber after, if we're clearing out one um, particular solution or after a fiber and we're changing um, changing solutions for the next. Um, yep, that's about all. Okay, Matt, do you have anything to add? Um, we, we generally <laughs> sort of see the same thing across labs, uh, uh, gentle but uh, consistent rinsing with DI water. Uh, we caution against using a strong acid or a strong base, which can strip the coating from the bath. Occasionally, perhaps with a swab, um, something like methanol might be used if you've got a bit of um, uh, saline buildup. But generally, if you're consistent with, uh, with the rinsing, um, it, it, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't have this sort of uh, staining from the, uh, from the calcium from the saline uh, solution. Okay, great. Um, Tim, actually, how do you prepare and transport your samples? Yeah, so so in particular, um, you know, if it if it's if it's a muscle biopsy that we get on site here, we don't we don't really have to do too much with it. We 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 get it. We go through our our um, procedure for permeabilizing or skinning the fiber, um, and then store it in the 
in the 50-50 mixture of, of ethanol, uh, sorry, not ethanol, of glycerol and, re and a relaxing solution so that the fiber um, uh, is in a relaxed state, but we can store it at minus 20 degrees. Um, for biopsies that we get from African animals, where, where, uh, where the head of the lab, Alan Wilson, is out in Africa, and he's, he's darted an animal to, to, uh, to put on a, a tracking collar, he'll get a biopsy there in the field and they'll have to treat it, skin it. They'll have to be skinned and permeabilized in the field, but then it'll need to be deep frozen. Uh, so, so that extra step is to um, put it into a high sugar solution, um, either sucrose or trehalose is what we use. Um, and then, uh, so you replace all of the relaxing solutions with this high trehalose or high sucrose um, solution. And then freeze it in, in liquid nitrogen. Um, in, in our case, we, we brought them back into the UK in a, in a, um, a dry shipper. So it's, it's liquid nitrogen level temperature, but of course there's, it's, a, it's a, in, a, in a dry state. Um, and that's fine for shipping um, preparations back here. And then once they're in the UK, we go through the reverse procedure, um, thawing them out and replacing the the uh, cryoprotectant sugar with um, with uh, the relaxing solution, and we're ready to go. Okay, um, Matt, this one's actually for you. Is it possible to isolate baths seven and eight rather than one and two on the eight hundred two D plate? In, in in terms of what the uh, the cold zone uh, and what the warm zone is, uh, it's certainly possible. Um, it would require redesigning the, the two pieces of the plate, uh, sort of doing a, a, a left hand versus right hand thing. But um, uh, it, it's certainly possible to, to redesign it that way. Okay. Um, Tim, this one is for you. Uh, did you try the staircase approach in order to obtain multiple force control events within a single activation? Um. Yeah, so, so what Haley is referring to there is, is, is um, by the staircasing approach is, is rather than um, in our case where we, where we do a single um, force control, we hold the force at, at, at less than isometric for a certain period of time, we bring our length back to the L0 and we do another separate um, force control event. The staircasing approach is just to do one force uh, level, then immediately into a second, and then immediately into a third. And, and we did, there's lots of nice data out in the literature using that. Um, and, and really, we're not, we're not saying that our way is, is better, it's just different. And uh, we, did, we did experiment with it. The only, the only thing I would say is that um, we've had the view that really the fiber was um, shortening a little too far beyond its um, optimal level of, of, of overlap, um, particularly at, at high velocities, trying to get three of those force control events in a staircase approach uh, really didn't seem to be succeeding very much for us. That was, that was thing one. So high, high, high velocities were, were one issue where we might have had to might have had to break it down into single single um, force control events uh, anyway, so we wouldn't be gaining um, uh, in terms of minimizing the number of overall activations. The other the other thing is we found um, that um, the f second and third of the staircase, the second and third. Um, events were lying really on a different force velocity curve than than the first one so you know we we we, we could generate different force velocity curves um uh depending on whether you were using just the first uh of the fir force controls in the staircase or if you're using them all we didn't understand why that was but we seemed to be because it was shortening um quite a long way in this staircasing approach um, at that point, that's when we started to, to try and rethink the process. And this is what, when we came up with trying to do this by a single event and then bring the length back to the L0 before we do another event, another event, another event, always bringing the length back to the starting point and the force back to isometric. Uh, 
Okay, great. Um, and actually, in the interest of time, we are going to make this uh, next question our last one for the day. Um, but any questions that we have not uh, gotten a chance to address live here, we will address in a full Q&A report following the event. Um, so Tim, what microscope do you use in, uh, in your lab? Right. Um, well, it has to be an inverted microscope. Um, and we, we have, uh, we have an old, uh, Nikon diaphot, uh, fluorescence microscope. The fluorescence, um, parts of it have been, have been stripped away, but that doesn't matter. We don't need them anyway, but it is an inverted microscope with a, I think a, a quite a large, um, access 10 centimeter access through the, um, through the two-way stage. Um, and yeah, literally we, we rescued that off of, off of the heap. It was destined to be thrown away. So <laughs> we, we, uh, yeah. Uh, and, and the, uh, the only other, the only thing we've really added to it was, a was this, a 40 X objective lens with a long working distance so that the, it can accommodate the, uh, the drop down feature of the 802 plate. Um, drop as it drops down and indexes along to the next bath, um, and and even that lens is not anything special. We didn't pay thousands for it. I'm sure it was secondhand, and uh, you know it's it's not it's not a particularly high high quality lens. It's good enough for us to see what we need to see, and arguably it's even good enough for us to 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 start doing some filming with the uh, the camera. Uh, so, you know, we don't do anything special with the illumination or with the, uh, the microscope per se, but, uh, you know, other people won't be as lucky to find one on the heap like we did. <laughs> um, Matt, do you actually have any input for those who may not be as fortunate as uh, Dr. West? Well, you know, to be honest, um, I, I sort of really do agree with Tim, uh, at least for the purpose of these contractile experiments. Um, you don't really need something uh, terribly fancy, um, you know, that doesn't need to be one particular brand over another. Uh, it does need to be an inverted microscope. Um, the few things that we really suggest, uh, one, the flat three plate stage um, that, uh, that, that Tim mentioned, uh, that's really essential. You need to be able to obviously position your prep uh, over the objective. Uh, you, can't, you can't really do this manually with any accuracy or, or, or easily. That three plate stage needs to have at least uh, a 100 millimeter circular cutout to accommodate the size of the plate. That's pretty standard. Uh, a larger cutout uh, doesn't hurt, um, but, but you sort of need that flat uh, plate with the circular cutout. You need sufficient clearance between your um, condenser and, and the bath. It has a bit of an appreciable uh, size. It's not a simple 100 well plate. Uh, you sort of also must have a camera port if you want to take a measure of SL, something that can accommodate a C-mount adapter. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you do need long working distance objectives. Um, uh, uh, Tim's... Uh, got a very elegant solution with this 40X. Uh, you don't need the most expensive 40X by any stretch of the imagination, but you need at least a few millimeters of working distance uh, to accommodate the movement of the plate. And also uh, the fact that the fiber will not be sitting directly on the um, sort of uh, cover slip, so to speak, or the, or the glass plate. So there needs to be, uh, needs to be a bit of room. Aside from that, the only thing I can really think of is if you want to mount the fibers into uh, the, the chamber while the, the apparatus is on the inverted scope, uh, I would suggest getting some sort of stereo um, mounting scope on a boom arm. Um, something that can kind of swing over top and then swing out of the way. Um, we've seen that in a number of different laboratories, and, and that can be quite handy. Yeah, that that that's what we do. We 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 don't. Um, I realize that you 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 can move the apparatus away from the microscope and then back to, to do your mounting, but we don't do that. We we leave it on 
the microscope and we use a boom mounted dis dis you know di dissecting scope to to mount the fibers and and if anybody was looking anybody came across the old diaphot um it's actually quite nice because the condenser just flips out of the way altogether uh so it's quite easy to get in to mount the fibers great i love that diaphot too <laughs> Well, thank you both so much for your contributions to this very engaging Q&A. Well, thanks for having us, Haley. Uh, it was a great time. Yeah, thanks, Haley, and thanks, Matt. In closing, thank you again for taking part in this Inside Scientific webinar, and we look forward to having you with us again soon. Have a wonderful day, everyone.